Bienvenue. Uh, if you're looking for our interview with author Martin Walker, you're in the right place. My name is Josette Marsh, and I am a vice president on the Federation Alliance Francaise USA board and the president of the Alliance Francaise of Hawaii. So while we're waiting for people to join us, I'd like to remind you of some upcoming Federation events. These are all free for Alliance Francaise members and can be found on the Federation website, afusa.org. Most of you have attended many Federation Zoom events, but for those of you joining us for the first time, let's go over a few housekeeping notes. First of all, please stay on mute during the presentation. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box and we'll um, get to them during the question and answer period. Select speaker view so that you can see both the PowerPoint presentation and um, Martin at the same time. And during screen shares, you can resize your images. And if for some reason there's a technical issue, just sign out of Zoom and sign back on. And the event is being recorded. So we should have a total run time of one hour. So now it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, author and historian, Martin Walker. During his 25 years as an international correspondent with the British daily newspaper, The Guardian, he served as its bureau chief in Moscow and in Washington, DC. He then worked as editor for United Press International and is now its editor emeritus and international affairs columnist. Besides serving on editorial and advisory boards for various publications, Martin is a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, a senior fellow of the World Policy Institute at the New School University in New York, and a director of Global Panel, an international policy advisory body. His books include The Cold War, A History, The President They Deserve, about the rise, falls, and comeback of Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, and an historical novel, The Caves of Perigord. Martin's detective novel series, Bruno, Chief of Police, is in its 17th publication, and his award-winning cookbook will soon be available in English. So please join me on, in welcoming uh, Martin Walker. Hi, Martin. Hi, Josette. Bonjour, everybody. So let's start with your career in international journalism. I suppose that the most interesting period of your career was while you were in Moscow. Can you tell us about life in general in Russia? Well, I'd been in other places before. I'd done a lot of Middle East and, <clears throat> and of Africa. Um, but Moscow was really extraordinary because I had to open the Guardian's Bureau there in that very... Uh, symbolic year 1984 and at that time the cold war was still pretty warm um, and we had uh, Brezhnev had died we had a, a very old and Andropov the former head of the KGB had taken over then he died was replaced by Chernyenko and I was actually there in Moscow at the time when Chernyenko died and we had the great funeral um, in, uh, in, in the Kremlin and then uh, to many people's surprise in came this much younger figure, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And I'd, I'd been tipped off by Russian friends that this guy was different. And I'd got hold of the text of a, of a speech that he'd made to uh, local party cadres, cadres when he first used the word perestroika, or reconstruction, rebuilding, and the need for the Soviet Union to change. Equally, um, through various contacts in acting and the literary world, I'd been at a couple of parties where I'd met Raisa Gorbachev, the, uh, the wife of Mikhail Gorbachev, who was very much of a figure in the kind of intelligentsia and artistic world in Moscow. And there was a huge excitement among these people I knew about the prospects for real change. And I got this sense that the Soviet Union was, was actually pregnant with change at this time. This is a, that's an image of me in Red Square giving, um, giving some flowers to Raisa Gorbachev uh, on Woman's Day and to the right is their daughter, Oksana. Um, and I, I thought she was terrific, Raisa Gorbachev. And there was a, it was a very powerful marriage between her and Mikhail. And um, I could not believe, <coughs> I could not believe the perceived change that was taking place. And I wrote a book about, uh, about it called The Waking Giant, Gorbachev and Perestroika, 
which actually said this guy is going to create a revolution. And the Wall Street Journal, to its uh, to its credit, in its review, said well, this book is written by a European liberal who does not understand that the word glasnost is Russian for a shortage of barbed wire. And so uh, a year later, when Gorbachev came to Washington, and even the Wall Street Journal admitted that you know this guy was really changing things, uh, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal suggesting that they might want to revise their review since I'd got it right and they'd got it wrong. And I was, it was just a wonderful time to be a journalist because the, the whole of uh, the Soviet Union just seemed to be shifting with this sense of change and time to get rid of these dreadful old men like Brezhnev and uh, Andropov and uh, Chernyenko. So uh, I was very lucky to be there at that right time. And I was also lucky in that because I hadn't been a Soviet expert. I didn't know who was the third secretary in the in the oblast of uh, of Kitai, for example. What I did was follow my own instincts, and so I began looking around for people writing about rock music, and came across a wonderful young guy called Artyom Troitsky, who was writing for Komsomolskaya Pravda, the youth paper, occasionally about rock music. So I went to meet him. And he and I began, he began taking me to some of these underground rock concerts that were taking place. And as often as not, they were taking place in elite universities. And it was children of members of Central Committee who were really getting into all of this rock music. And on the anniversary of John Lennon's death, um, I went up with my boombox up to the uh, MGU, the Moscow Un State University of the Lenin Hills, and with what it became about 300 young Russian students around me, I just began playing track after track of John Lennon to uh, commemorate his passing. So it was it was a great it was a great time. I was lucky to be there. After that, I became bureau chief in the states. I couldn't have had really a, a, a better stroke of luck in my career than to get to to Moscow at this time. So, um, what do you think? Uh... If, if you if you're thinking about the relationship of us the United States and Russia then and now what do you think the future feuds hold the future holds for the two countries well I'm I, I think the future for for Russia is very grim despite uh, despite the power he amassed Vladimir Putin has not been able to create a modern economy in Russia. There are really almost no modern car factories. The only area where they are competitive is in weapons and in cyber affairs, but there is no industrial economy. Um, and there is a huge sense of frustration among many young Russians that I stay in touch with about it. And above all, the Soviet, the Russian economy is still dependent upon the export of oil and gas. And I think that is coming to an end. Climate change is making that, I think, a, a hopeless proposition for the future. So when I combine that with the disastrous levels of, of the disastrous challenge of demographics, the vast numbers of or the very small numbers of young children being born, the Soviet Union is probably going to be uh, halving its population in the course of this century, or sorry, Russia will be halving its population this century. It's got a huge, it's built up a huge amount of ill will in various neighbours, particularly Ukraine. It's got a, a really expensive hole in the in the Crimea. It's not trusted anymore. All of that sense of support that came with Gorbachev's attempt to reform the Soviet Union, that's pretty much. So I fear that the that Russia is in for a very grim time. How we react to that is going to be very, very important. That's really interesting, Martin. Thank you for that. Um, you also wrote a book about the presidency of Bill Clinton. Can you give us a little background on your motivation to write the book? Well, I suppose the motivation was that when I left Moscow and I was going over to the States to become to become the bureau chief for the Guardian, I went down to Little Rock to see, in Arkansas, to see somebody I'd known from my days at Oxford University, because Bill was there at the same time. He was a graduate student. He was a, a Rhodes Scholar. 
Um, but we, we, I had a girlfriend who shared a house with a girl who was a great friend of his. So we'd meet there from time to time. And I went to, um, I went to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to Little Rock. Bill was governor. I knew that he'd, written, he'd read my book about Gorbachev because he sent me a nice note about it. And he said, what are you doing now? I said, well, I, I think I'll write a history of the Cold War. And he said, you know, the big thing that's going to change is that all of our lives, it's always international affairs have been about missiles, bombs, throw weights, and arms control summits. And the future is going to be about exports, trade figures, and international trade and economic summits. We're moving from an age of geopolitics to an age of geoeconomics. And this was in, what, 1989. I thought, wow, that's... That's a very acute. That's a very acute interpretation of the future, and so I, when Bill decided he was going to run for the presidency, in uh, in 1991, I uh, I was actually down there. It was the birthday of uh, of his daughter Chelsea, and I did an interview with him, and then I was travelling with him before, in the days before the New Hampshire primary. Um, and uh, I just followed that campaign very closely. So I would go and see Bill for an interview from time to time. And uh, I was invited onto Air Force One a couple of times and to you know, sit there and chat with him. And one day, uh, my wife and our two daughters were staying with friends of ours in France. And I was actually in the White House about to go into the Oval Office to have an interview with Bill Clinton. And um, as I was about to go into the office, my wife called and said, I don't care what you're doing, drop everything and get the next plane to France. I've found our house. And I said, well, I, I, I have to go into the Oval Office. I'm interviewed sort of, sort of Bill Clinton. And she said, well, as soon as you can. So three days later, I was on the plane to France where Julia had indeed found our house. Uh, I've found that the secret of a happy marriage is to accept that the wife is always right. And uh, Julia was certainly right about this place and about finding the house. And her point was that as foreign correspondents, we really needed some fixed place which the children could think of as a, as a permanent home. And uh, so Julia had found this place in the Perigord and I, none of us have ever regretted it. It's a, a glorious area. And it was because of being here that I began to, to write these novels about France and about the Perigord. Well, I think Julia has excellent advice, to be honest. <laughs> um, so that was my next question. How did you, how did you find it? Um, tell us a, a little bit about life in, um, in our, our little uh, part of uh, France. Our little corner of paradise. Well, I mean, bear in mind that the Perigord has always been a very special place. In the very earliest accounts of the tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, um, the, um, the Perigord is the land that Sir Lancelot gives to his son, Sir Galahad, as the land of milk and honey. And it's the land where the Holy Grail is to be found by, by Sir Galahad. Um, when, I, when I walk out of, of this place in one direction, I come to a, a small cave or a, a cave shelter called uh, La Ferrasi. And it's the world's oldest known cemetery. It's 73,000 years old. And there are eight people buried there. Um, one of them, a man who had not been able to walk for several weeks, or several years rather, because he had a very bad leg injury. And these people had taken care of him, which is one of the, I think, one of the key signs of social development, that you take care of your, of your sick and your elderly. Um, and I just find it extraordinary, this 73,000 years old, and I can just walk past it every day. There's um, another one, another little stroll I make to a place called Limay, which is, uh, oh, 15 minutes from my house. It's a lovely old hill town. Um, and the archaeologists found there a whole bunch of small squares, uh, stone squares about two hands in width, on which are engraved a number of different animals, either um, a stag uh, or a, an auroch, a bull um, or, um, or a bird. And 
people have tried to work out why there were hundreds of these things almost identical. And sometimes a, a leg had been scratched out and redrawn. The only explanation they could come up with was this was the world's first art school where people were learning how to engrave and design and draw these figures. They're about 12,000, 12 to 13,000 years old. I mean, there's nowhere else in the world like this. I mean, this, this was Times Square for prehistoric people. I mean, there were more of them were living here and creating, inventing art here, like at Lascaux, than anywhere else. And so when, I, when we got this place, I became absolutely fascinated by caves and was I visited as many as I could I and like any good journalist I went to interview archaeologists and, and went to the local museums and read up and studied on it and I I was so fascinated by the idea of how what kind of society could have created this masterpiece of the Lascaux cave 18,000 years ago that I decided to write a novel about it so that was the caves of Perigord and I enjoyed it so I enjoyed the process of writing it so much that I then um, at the local tennis club uh, came across a, a terrific guy, a very good cook, um, a fine hunter, former French soldier, uh, spent all of his spare time teaching the, teaching the local kids how to play tennis and play rugby. And he was our local village policeman. And his name was Pierrot. And so I thought, this is a perfect character to write about. And the only problem is he's a cop. So I'm going to have to write a kind of a crime story of some kind. How on earth do I do that? So that was the start of it. And um, we've now got number 16. I'm writing number 16, 17 at the moment in this uh, series of Bruno. And it's been, a, it's been an absolutely fascinating and enjoyable process. But um, um, I, the Perigord has just given me so much. I mean, I've, I've changed as a person here. I've become a gardener. I mean, I never thought I'd be a gardener, but I'd love sort of pottering around with my roses and and my and, and, and my and my geraniums and my and my vegetables. We live on we live on our, on our garden all summer with our salads and potatoes and peas and beans and and our chickens and um, and I spend you know, much of my time with friends in the little local village. We have a <clears throat> a ritual on Tuesday evenings. And which is called the Dîner de Celebataire, because that's the dinner of the uh, of the bachelors, because that is traditionally the day when the various wives go off to play bingo or lotto um, in the village halls. And so the tryst custom is that we guys in the village, we then have to cook for one another while the wives are away, and we take turns in cooking, and uh, we cook pretty well actually and uh, we just sit there drinking wine eating our food chatting about this and that and waiting for the women folk to come home to say whether they've won or lost at the uh, at the, at the lotto games but it's it's a kind of a, a sense of community there's something lovely about france josette that you know if you go into a shop you will say bonjour madame and they will say bonjour to you and when you leave you will say bonjour et merci beaucoup à la prochaine and there is a, an inbuilt automatic sense of courtesy and etiquette, which is a part of the local community. I go down to the market in, in my town, I'll know two thirds of the people there, except in the tourist season. Um, and when you see my, you know, the local policeman patrolling the market, it takes him half an hour to get down the street because he's stopping to shake hands with the guys. He's got to kiss the women on the cheeks. It's a, it's a, this is how you make a community. This is how there is a, a real sense of place and of uh, solidity about, about living here. And that's something I want to celebrate, along with the food, the wine, the douceur de vie, the, the sweetness of life that they have here. I can't agree more, but I do have a question. What's your favorite dish to prepare for the Dîner de Celebrataire? Well, I, um, I have two. One is something I'm terribly proud of, which is my own invention, which is, uh, we call it uh, Boeuf Perigordin. You've all heard of Boeuf Bourguignon. Boeuf Bourguignon is quite simply, it's beef uh, in a casserole with wine from Burgundy. And I thought, well, why don't we do it with our own Bergerac red wine rather than with Burgundy? And we, have to have, we have to have something extra. And... Every year, we make our own vin de noir, 
walnut wine. So in about the third week of June, when the walnuts are plump, but they're green and white inside, and they're not formed into nuts, we go out and we pick about 40 or 50 of them, chop them up, put them into a great big fetu, a great big, a great big uh, bowl, add eight liters of red wine or white wine, according to taste, one liter of very strong eau de vie, which is not entirely legal, but you can find it. And the locals will put in a kilo of sugar. I put in half a kilo, and even that I find a bit sweet. You stir it up, you cover the fetu, you put it in a dark corner for a couple of months, then you filter it and bottle it. And I'm still enjoying my 2006 Van de Noir. But I thought for this Boeuf Perigordin, as well as the good Bejerac red wine, I would add a glass of my own homemade Van de Noir. Oh, it, it gives it a little touch of, of sweetness and spice that I find delightful. The other thing that the people, my people like, my neighbors like is um, a Scottish dish that I learned from my mother, which is fish pie. And you get um, about a kilo of white fish like cod or haddock and some fillets of smoked, of smoked herring. <clears throat> and you... Um, you cook them in milk. You make a roux with the with the milk after the cooking, with uh, butter and flour. You then add in uh, some sliced uh, hard boiled eggs, and I will add in some crevettes, some uh, some shrimp, and then you cover it all with mashed potato. Sprinkle on top some cheese. Put it in the oven. Oh, it's lovely. And with with a good white wine, it's a, it's a feast. So those are my two specialities, and I'm, I'm very proud of both of them. Well, I know what I'm having for dinner the next time I come over to your place. And uh, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> Janine, Janine is um, nodding her head in approval. It's really, <laughs> really great. So it seems as though the Perigord has chosen you as well as you choosing choosing it. Um, it's a very a, seductive place, Josette, as you know. <laughs> there's a wonderful photo of you in, with a group of um, men in a club that Melissa will pull up, and maybe you can explain what you're doing here. Ah, <laughs> this is, um, I was being in, intronisé, I was being formally introduced as a member of, um, of a brotherhood a confrérie of something called Chabrol. And as you can see, I'm wearing formal Scottish dress with my kilt and my, my, uh, my, my Scots jacket. And Chabrol is a tradition of the Perigord in which you always begin meal with a soup of some kind. And you never entirely finish the soup. You leave a certain amount in there and you then pour in some red wine, stir it all up, and then you drink it. You drink the wine and the soup together. And that is called Chabrol. So this is the Confrérie de Chabrol. And all of my colleagues in the Confrérie are dressed up in their, in their sort of three musketeers kind of cloaks and outfits. And um, the origin of this term Chabrol is somewhat disputed, but I'm pretty sure that I've got the right version. Um, it dates a very, very long time back. It has different names in different parts of France, but in both Normandy, and in the Perigord and in, uh, and in Aquitaine as a whole, where the English were for some 300 years, from the marriage of Eleanor of Aquitaine in 1152 until 1453, the Battle of Castillon, when the English were finally thrown out, the English were there and there were English garrisons everywhere. Now, to feed the garrisons of the English castles that were scattered around the area was not easy in this time when you couldn't keep the, the cattle alive, or most of the cattle you would not keep alive beyond, beyond autumn. There, there just wasn't the feed there for them. So what the, the mainstay of the food of the English castle garrisons was, and they would make this into some kind of a soup. Now, as you know, one of the English terms for soup is broth. And the English word, the old English word for a young herring is a shad. So if you say shad broth, shad broth, shad broth, pretty soon you get to chabrol. Shad broth, shad broth, shad broth. That is the origin of it. Now, my French friends will tell me, oh no, 
It's because Monsieur Montaigne, the great essayist, uh, first had the dish at a house of a Monsieur Chabrol. Huh. I prefer my version. I think it's much, uh, it's a much more fun version, particularly when there were so many signs uh, around here still of that English presence in the Middle Ages. Um, there's a, a, a small village very near me called Biga Rock, which is defined by a very big rock in the middle of the village. And um, then in in uh, in Bordeaux, there is a famous street by the uh, by the old mint called Rue des Arlots. There is no word in French for Arlo. It doesn't mean anything except for the English. It was where the prostitutes were, the street of harlots. Sorry, that's the English tradition. It's been around here for a very long time. That's really funny. <laughs> um, so um, getting back to Bruno, um, we understand that he's written a cookbook and we've already had a question about when it's gonna be available in the United States because just for now, it's been published in, in German. Um, yeah. So do you have any good news for us? I do. It's coming out. Knopf is bringing it out next year in English, um, and it's going to be a, a combination of of the combination compilation of this cookbook um, and the second cookbook uh, called Bruno's Garden Cookbook. Um, and it's um, I'm I'm very pleased that I've uh, they asked me to write a, a special short story about Bruno to go into the cookbook. So it's not just going to be all the wonderful food and. Uh, and the wine and so on, but also uh, a Bruno story to go along with it. And I, I hope it does as well in America as it's done in Europe. I mean, I'm, uh, it was, I was awed to find that uh, we'd won a prize as best French cookbook of the year with it um, from Gourmet International, which was very hard for my French friends to, to swallow. The idea that a foreigner would write a book that wins best French cookbook was kind of tough to accept, but there we are. Um, and I just hope Amer Americans uh, and Brits enjoy it as well. The, um, but I've also got uh, some more news, which is that there's a collection of Bruno's short stories coming out later this year as well. Uh, various short stories that I've written over the years, they're being put together. And um, so Bruno keeps on writing again. And I understand that uh, Bruno has become a wine <laughs> Bruno what? Pardon? Bruno, I mean, has, uh, Bruno has become a vintner or has inspired a cuvee? Here we are. Cuvee Bruno, which you can tell because you can see here is the Basset Hound, Balzac, with the policeman's helmet. It's a 2018 Cuvee Bruno, and it's got a little drawing of Chateau Benac uh, behind it. And it's... Um, it's a very nice wine, though I say it myself. Um, you're very good health, everybody. When I say it's my wine, it's sort of why I grow the grapes. Um, I sort of cheat. I buy in the grapes from winemakers whom I know and trust, and then I blend them because all of the Bejerac wines are blends. All of the Bordeaux are blends. Normally it's Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, uh, sometimes a little bit of Malbec. And um, so I, I do the blending and I will always put in some Malbec because that was the, the wine served at the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine back in the 12th century. And I like to put in a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of one or two other grapes as well. We have a local grape called Perigord, which uh, uh, sort of almost died out with phylloxera, but it's now being redeveloped. And you can always put in a little bit of, of different wines into a Bergerac. So I have great fun blending. In fact, my friends and I and the Unalog and the winemakers, we have three or four very interesting days uh, putting the blend together for the new Cuvée Bruno. Cuvée Bruno. And um, this is the best one yet. And uh, but I, it, I have another career as well, which is I'm now, I write about wine quite a lot. So um, I have to start, I'm serving on juries for uh, for wine to select the Bergeracs we're going to send up to Paris for the Concours. And next month, I'm, I'm on the jury of there's nine of us who will be choosing the winemaker of the year. And so we're going to be sitting in the Chateau de Bourdais, tasting and tasting way. The only problem is, 
when you're drinking that many wines and tasting that many wines, you have to spit. You can't swallow, which is always the top part. But there we are. So I feel so sorry for you. Is yeah. the wine going to be available in the United States at, at some point? Um, they, there's a guy who, some people who are running the Fans of Bruno Facebook page uh, have arranged with a... Uh, a wine importer and a wine merchant uh, in Louisiana who is importing now uh, palettes of Bergerac wine, including Cube Bruno. So it's going to be available. If you go onto the website for uh, fans of Bruno on Facebook, uh, you will find uh, information there about how to reserve your bottles of the Cube Bruno. It's, it's difficult because we're still stuck with President Trump's extra tariffs on French wines and on French cheeses. And um, so it's, it's, it's more expensive than it ought to be. But I'm hoping that President Biden will change that and realize that decent French wine is an essential of a civilized American lifestyle. I couldn't agree more. Um, so before we get to um, your reading, um, what's, what's life like right now um, as far as the, the never ending confinement? Uh, What's it like? Well, you? it's, yeah, it's it been, it's not, it's not. Horrible. It's been grim. I mean, I haven't seen my daughter who lives in Seattle for 18 months. Um, I, um, I had Christmas with my family in London. And, um, and then the day before I was due to fly back to France, because I had to be at, attending at a certain, certain ceremony, uh, I was tested positive for COVID. So I had to, uh, isolate in the attic of our house in London while Julia would sort of drop off meals at the door for me. Then I got a clear test, came back to France and massive lockdown occurred. So I haven't seen Julia, my wife, since, uh, since, uh, since, since January. And that is really quite, it really is tiresome not to be you know, in touch with your wife and family and children. Um, and it's been, um, it's, it's really, can, it can be quite depressing, were it not for all of my friends in this village and the fact that we've all now been vaccinated and so there's a great deal less concern. And we do actually obey things like wearing masks in public and when we go shopping and even in the markets and so on. We, we, you know, we take it very, very seriously, but there is enough of a community here that nobody has gone crazy I mean, I thought I was going to go spare at one point. Um, but in fact, we actually do. And there are enough things that you have to do to work together. So, for example, we depend upon a lot, a lot upon uh, our wood burning stoves here in winter. And that's always a communal thing. We, we have to go into the woods together, cut to get the old trees, haul them out, chop them up, cut all of the wood into size, and then put it all into our log piles. And we do it not just for ourselves, but for our, all of our friends and our neighbors. And so for about three weeks, they were playing baby lumberjacks, which, but of course, every day we were doing this, there was a very fine lunch being prepared by you know, one, of the, uh, one of the households. But that is how, that is why this community really has got a very, very low level of infection and why people get through it. Because there is this sort of sense of, we're all in this together. There is a sense of mutual support. And they are, they are people who are accustomed to hardship. I mean, these, most of my, most of my neighbors are peasants or the children of peasants. And they, they've had a very different kind of life. They're much more adaptable than I am. They're much more comfortable with hardship than, than I ever had been. And so it's quite inspiring to, uh, to find myself, you know, working with them. I remember when I first, when I was first um, invited to one of the the big ceremonies of the uh, of, of of winter, which was the killing of the pig in uh, by one of the local farmers, and it was quite clear that I didn't know what I was doing. So I was dispatched with the children, with all of the intestines of the pig, down to the local stream where our job was to squeeze out the intestines, which were, because they were to be used as sausage skins. And so there we were, our little fingers and hands all frozen as we washed out these intestines in this freezing cold stream. 
while back up in the farmhouse, everybody was drinking away at eau de vie and, and carving off lumps of, uh, lumps of pig and uh, catching the blood to make blood pudding and so on. So I know my place. I mean, I am not, <laughs> I am not a peasant born, but I do like taking part. That's great. Thanks for that. That's wonderful, Martin. So we're going to um, um, we're going to be uh, have the good luck of hearing an ex excerpt from your lo uh, uh, latest <coughs> installment, and that's is this the coldest case that's going to be released soon? Is this right? is uh, coming out. I think it's in August. It comes out August third. Yes. Um, and um, it's uh, it's called the coldest case, and I have a neighbor, one of my neighbors. Um, Raymond is a retired uh, captain of gendarme, and uh, he was always haunted throughout his life by a case when he was uh, some a local farmer out with his dog found the dog found um, after some rains that some human remains had been unearthed in the forest. And so Raymond goes out to try and you know what on earth happened here? Was there a murder? Who was this dead person? And he could never identify him. He tried for years, years and years to identify this dead man. Called him Oscar. Kept a, keeps a photograph of Oscar in his, uh, in his kitchen. And so I thought, well, this is the kind of story that I think we can begin with. And uh, that's why I called it the coldest case. So here we are. Standing by the display case in the National Museum of Prehistory in Les Aisies, Bruno Courage, the chief of police, was transfixed by the three skulls before him. The first skull, the original that had been unearthed after some 70,000 years, was not quite complete. Beside it stood a new reconstruction of that same skull, an exact copy artificially filled in with the missing parts of the jaw and cranium. Behind them, glowing eerily, in the museum's carefully crafted lighting was a copy or perhaps a casting of the same skull made from an almost transparent blue plastic. Reluctantly, Bruno shifted his glance back to the original, whose caption said it was the closest to a perfect Neanderthal skull ever found. This skull, however, made him think of the curious obsession of his friend J.J. Jean-Jacques, chief detective for the department of the Dordogne, with another and much more modern skull. Bruno knew this one well, since its enlarged photograph had for three decades accompanied J.J. to every office he had occupied. These days, the photo was fixed to the back of J.J.'s office door, so he could see the skull from his place at the imposing desk that was standard issue for such a senior official. JJ's visitors could not miss it as they left his room. His fellow cops often speculated why JJ submitted himself willingly to this constant reminder of his first big case, the one he had failed to solve as a young detective some three decades earlier. What do you think of the exhibition, Bruno? You've been studying it long enough, asked Clotilde Daumier, a short and red-haired powerhouse of a woman who was one of the museum's curators, a leading expert upon the prehistory of the region. It's wonderful, Bruno replied. Thank you for inviting me to this preview. I'm overwhelmed with the skill of these reconstructions. Well, you can tell the artist yourself, Clotilde said, steering him towards an attractive grey-haired woman who moved gracefully as she advanced toward Bruno. Elizabeth Daines, meet Bruno Courage, our chief of police and a good friend who has a great interest in archaeology, even found a modern corpse in one of our ancient graves. Clotilde's archaeologist found it, Bruno said, smiling. I just helped find out who it was. But I'm really moved by, I'm moved by your work, madame, bringing these people back to life in this way. You are a great artist. You are very kind, Monsieur Bruno, Elizabeth replied. Her voice was soft, well modulated, with just a hint of an accent of the midi. How did you realize your body was not a prehistoric skeleton? 
because he was wearing a swatch, Bruno replied, that had only been made since 1983. But tell me, madame, have you ever worked with the police in trying to reconstruct the face of an, of an unidentified skeleton? Please call me Elizabeth, she said. Well, yes, we have, but the police can find it difficult. It's quite expensive. And then if you look at the kind of identifications that people give of strangers, they usually describe the hair, uh, its style and color, the color of the eyes and whether the face is fleshy or lean. These, however, are the three elements we cannot reliably discern from the skull itself. What we can do is to use the contours of the individual skull, which vary more than you might think, even among family members, to reconstruct each of the 43 muscles in the human face. So in terms of form and structure, we can go a long way to reconstruct the features of the hair and so on. They remain the enormous challenges. But if you could work with the police, would you do so? Indeed, Monsieur. After all, we succeeded thanks to this very technique we developed of computer, uh, of computer modeling of the skull. We succeeded in recreating the face of Tutankhamun, the pharaoh of Egypt, from his skull. You may have seen it in the National Geographic. And with the computer, we can share images of our progress with colleagues elsewhere in France, other parts of the world. When we did that face of Tutankhamun, the computer allowed us to stay in constant touch with the National Geographic people in Washington and with the Cairo Museum. So if you knew the hair color and that the body fat, the body was out of a young man in his 20s, athletic and probably without much body fat, could you reconstruct something in which you would have confidence? I always have confidence in my work, Monsieur Bruno, but should I assume that you have some particular skeleton or skull in mind and you're hoping to enlist my help <laughs> this is the coldest case and it starts off bruno on one of the strangest inquiries of his career and it all comes from the reconstruction of the skulls in the museum of les Aisy. and um, i must tell you that if you ever see these reconstructions they are eerily eerily close you actually can envisage the faces, the structures of the uh, of, of these people. And one thing that I learned from this, from this exhibition, this particular exhibition, was the difference between Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnon people who replaced them, was that Neanderthals, they wore furs, but they, the furs were sort of wrapped around them and loosely tied with rawhide. The Cro-Magnon people, Homo sapiens sapiens, our direct ancestors, invented the needle. They invented sewing. So they were able to sew together the furs and thus to create things like trousers and sleeves and sleeping bags. In other words, they were able to adapt themselves very much more to the Ice Age than the Neanderthals had been. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating. I don't know about you. That's great, Martin. Thank you so much. Um, before uh, we get to uh, Q and A, uh, I just want to give everybody a little glimpse of what's coming up for this summer, and maybe Martin, you can talk about it a little since um, it's one of your favorite pastimes. Uh, the marché. Ah, the, here we are in the, the following, Actually, the following. Um, the next slide. There we go. There. Oh, this is a night market. The uh, one of the great developments of the last decade or 15 years or so in the Perigord has been they developed, they invented the night market in which um, local producers, cheesemakers, uh, growers of veg salads, vegetables and so on, local butchers, they will uh, put on barbecues, they will cook dishes in the main square and then they put hundreds of tables and chairs into the square they'll provide a band with music and everybody just gathers together of course there are wine stores there as well you go and buy whatever it is you want to eat you meet up with your friends you drink the wine you have a dance it's absolutely glorious it's like a village it's like a village ball every night in summer can't recommend it highly enough 
sorry, there we go. And the next oh. slide. This happens to be Belves, which is the closest uh, village to... Indeed. Well, Belves has got a very, very nice one. And Belves, like so many of the towns in the Perigord, is an old Bastide. Now, the Bastides were the new towns of the Middle Ages that were built as to be part fortress, part town. And it was there were ways to reassure the local peasants that uh, they would not be left at the mercy of the marauding English or the marauding French, but also as a way for um, the king or the duke or whoever to make sure he collected the taxes because the peasants would be living inside that particular town and the town had its walls and usually the church was the last bastion of defense if needed but we have more bastides in the perigord than anywhere else in france and they're wonderful for this kind of night market because they have this big central square and lovely old buildings Sorry, great. Um, I think it's night, now time for a QA. and a um, I'm gonna go in order the, the questions that were put in the chat box. Um, okay. Will Bruno ever become a t TV series? And if so, who would play the lead as Bruno? Uh, well, uh, yes, the, um, um, the German uh, UFA um, film company, um, Ufa was the famous one where Malik Malin and Dirkwick got started back in the 1920s, 1930s and so on. Ufa bought the rights to make the TV series and they have a deal with Arte, which is a French TV network. So French and in, Eng French and in German, but the discussion now is whether they should film in English or in German or in French. And they think it's going to be in English and then dubbing it into the other two languages. So uh, I can't wait for it to happen. I have seen a photograph of their plan for Bruno, of their character for Bruno, I am sworn to secrecy. But when my wife, Julia, saw his photo, she said, hmm, do you think he'd like a private tour of the Perigord? And I said, no, I don't think he would. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, that's great. Um, another question is, why are the titles of your books different in the UK than apparently they are in the United States? Is that true? Oh, if I could, some of them are different. If I could fathom the thinking of publishers, whether in London or in the USA, uh, I'd be a, I'd be a happier, I'd be a happier person. Um, some of them want different titles because they have a, a certain view of the series. Um, some of them change their titles. I mean, the one that was uh, originally called the first one in the series, Bruno, Chief of Police, is now called in Britain. Um, death the death in the Dordogne um, and the thing is it's not down to me anymore once I have written the story sent it in to the publishers in effect I mean I've abandoned my my production I, I no longer really own it um, if they want to change the title they can change the title um, beware of falling into the hands of publishers wonderful people though they are they can sometimes get it wrong but um uh, I don't know. It's just I, I just feel so embarrassed when I hear from somebody, oh, I bought that book thinking it was a different one, but it turns out I'd read it under another title. And I thought, oh, God, publishers. Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> life of a, life of an author. Right. Um, next question. Someone during the summer, a summer, made um, a Vandenois, which was very nice, but he was told, or they were told, um, that it was not authentic because they used black walnuts instead of English walnuts. Is that true? I didn't quite, they, what were they trying to make? Why? No, they made, they made a Vandenois one summer. A Vandenois, okay. And, um, but they were told it was not authentic because they used black walnuts instead of English walnuts. Is that true? Um, no, I mean, well, I, <laughs> walnuts are walnuts, and in fact, walnuts of any kind, in June, in early June, they are green. They are green with a white pith inside, and that's from that that the nut eventually forms. So as long as you're picking them before the, you know, before the 20th of June, you should be all right. Um, and I, I think what the really authentic thing is, of course, that you get the right eau de vie. Um, because anybody can get walnuts, anybody can get red wine, but the eau de vie is, uh, can be a little bit tricky. Um, my wife, is, who is a, a food writer, 
uh, is suggesting she's become quite a critic of sugar for the amount of water that uh, every sugar cane requires to, to grow. And she's suggested that I make an experiment this year to instead of, uh, instead of using uh, half a kilo of sugar, to try using honey instead, which I think could be quite interesting. And I might give that a go, sort of a kind of a cross between me and I didn't want so. Let us know how it turns out. Um, the next you, question- you one of the first guinea pigs, Josette. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, in, the next question is in Fatal Pursuit. Um, how did you become interested and um, so well-versed in the history of Bugatti? Well, um, thanks to my elder daughter, Kate, who um, is a quite a well-known motorsports journalist. She goes to all of the Grand Prix every year. Um, she does commentary for ESPN and uh, uh, she writes for various motoring publications and newspapers. And uh, she you know, knows lots of the drivers and she is, um, she's really hugely knowledgeable about all of this. And it was she who told me about this Bugatti that had disappeared uh, in France in the middle of World War II and it disappeared somewhere between Alsace and Bordeaux. And of course, that means going right through the Perigord. And um, but it was being driven at the time by two men, um, both of whom were former racing drivers for Bugatti, and both of whom were members of the resistance, who were later arrested and killed by the Nazis uh, before the end of the war. So they never explained what they had done to hide this famous lost Bugatti. And all this is entirely true. And once I had heard this story from Kate, I thought, this sounds like a case for Inspector Bruno. And uh, I, it was great fun doing it and I, because I, I, you know, I began to do a lot of research about it and um, went back into some of the old uh, 1930s um, society photographs of people standing with their Bugattis in Cannes and Nice and trying to work out the difference between the, the T-34 and the, the Teep Atlantique and so on. Um, no, I, I, one of the pleasures about doing this kind of book is I like doing the research and I, I try to get it right, whether it's about the resistance or about prehistory or about Bugattis or about reconstructing skulls um, with computer and laser technology. Uh, it is great fun. You find yourself learning all sorts of bizarre things. Well, I hope that Kate gets at least some of the royalties from Fatal Pursuit for her, um, her, for her inspiration. Um, Kate does speaking, well. <laughs> speaking of um, skull reconstruction, uh, one of the questions was, how do you, how do you move from fact, i.e. The, the technology of skull reconstruction uh, to fiction? Um, well, in a, in a way you, I mean, so a police friend of mine told me in a way that uh, a writer is doing what they're doing. They are building up hypotheses upon what facts they have got. And they're trying to think what hypothesis might fit those facts. And so as a writer of fiction, I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to build a, I'm trying to create a credible story out of these basic facts. Um, and um, I don't know how I do it. I mean, no writer can really tell you how you make things up because basically that's what you're doing. But it's what I find is that Bruno has now been around long enough that I feel I know his village and his community and his friends pretty much as well as I know my own friends. And that um, I am more and more intrigued by the interaction of all of these friends and by their relationships and the dogs and the horses and the meals they share together and the trust they have in each other i find all of this really quite captivating and i'm um, i i'm always very keen to find out what bruno is going to be up to next and i lie wet at night trying to think what can it be this time <laughs> Well, we're interested too, but I don't think a lot of us are lined up awake at night. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll leave that to you. Um, okay, another question and then a comment. When will thick-headed Bruno realize that Florence is the woman for him 
And the comment uh, from someone else is, uh, someone else is rooting for Isabel, and, um, but um, Isabel's not gonna give him the children that he desires. So when is he gonna realize that Florence is the, um, the, the woman for him? I, I have always listened to the advice of Julia, my wife, who had been married over 40 years. Um, and Julia says, the moment that you let Bruno marry, you will lose half of your readers. And I thought I was sort of, you know, trying to build up various possibilities of, of women folk for Bruno. But Julia is quite firm upon this. I, I don't know where this is going. In fact, in, the, in this new book, The Coldest Case, Bruno has to become much closer to, uh, to Florence because her divorced husband comes back. Aha! Yeah. Not only do we have the reconstruction of the skull, but we have all of that as well. Sounds great. Um, to answer one of the questions in the chat, the, um, the story about the Bugatti is in Fatal Pursuit. Mm -hmm. And um, and maybe the, one of the last questions, um, how did you choose Le Bug? For oh, Julia chose it. I mean, in fact, I had an old friend um, when I was reporting in the Middle East in Lebanon back in the 70s. There was a, a terrific guy who was uh, uh, who was working there. And he then uh, married uh, at about the same time that Julia and I got married. And we met up again in London. And then his wife, Gabrielle, um, inherited a place in, in the Perigord. Uh, she's French, and um, we would go out there and spend time with them. So when our first baby was born, uh, their first baby had just been born. So uh, Michel and I were building the terrace outside of his house, and Julia and Gabrielle were cooking up wonderful things in the kitchen. And our two little baby daughters were rolling around stark naked on the grass and... and um, we just found it idyllic and we would go and stay with them. And it was, Julia was staying with these friends of ours while I was in the White House waiting to see Bill Clinton and suddenly being told, your future has changed. We're buying a house in France. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, I hope I got all the questions in the chat. Melissa, is it possible for people to unmute themselves if they have any um, additional questions? Sure, if people could get and unmute themselves now. Does anybody have any questions for Martin? Is I everybody know, I, May I, I just I agree with Le Bug. It's a wonderful place. Le Bug, I know it. I went to that market years and years and years. And I know the Perigord, I know Vert, uh, mm -hmm. all these. And there are a lot of Brits actually in the Perigord. You know that, Martin, yeah. right? You Brits. buy up all the good places, like the castles and the so on. <laughs> <laughs> no, lots of Brits, lots of uh, lots of Dutch and Belgians, and more and more Americans, and more mm -hmm. and more Germans. Well, it's a very international place. Um, mm -hmm. but, and that, of course, is where the strawberries come from. So, oh. and this time of year, I eat a lot of strawberries, apart from the ones I get in my garden, oh. and I can't myself, so I get the that ones in the market. <laughs> And Martin, someone wants to know, is Saint-Denis modeled after Le Bug? Sorry? Sorry? Is Saint-Denis modeled after Le Bug? Someone um, wants to yes, um, about 80% of it. But I've imported uh, a church from somewhere else because I find the one in Le Bug a bit boring. And um, I've imported lots of fake characters, of course. But yeah, the market is the market. <coughs> the bridge is the, <coughs> the bridge is the bridge. The uh, the mairie is the mairie. The mayor is a bit of a blend of a couple of mayors that I've known here. Both of them very cunning old gentlemen. And um, yeah, but I I didn't dare call it Le Bug because I thought if this goes wrong, I'll be sort of, I'll be taken out of, I'll be ridden out of town on a rail and tarred and feathered and so on. So uh, I tried to be uh, very careful about that. <laughs> That's great. Melissa, can we show the screen again with a picture of um, the 17th installment, right, um, Martin? The Coldest Case, which will be released on August 3rd, 
And Melissa has put the link to um, the publisher in the chat box. So if there are lots of compliments, uh, Martin, everybody loves your books. Mm -hmm. So if there are no other questions, can we unmute ourselves and give Martin a big round of applause? Oh, gosh, thank you. Bravo! 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 Bravo!